Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Fago Maradian here at the Aerospace Industries Association headquarters in Northern Virginia to talk to John Luddy, the Vice President for National Security Policy here at AIA. John, thanks for the time. Pleasure to be here with you. Um, obviously, uh, the AIA is very, very focused on uh, industrial uh, policy uh, and including increasingly considering uh, what kind of industrial strategies the nation uh, might need. Uh, obviously, U.S.-China trade war uh, has uh, prompted Beijing to threaten to cut off, uh, cut the United States off from uh, rare earth elements, which are critical uh, to microelectronics. Uh, the Obama administration uh, started uh, a process to try to increase stockpiles and look at alternate sources after Beijing cut off Tokyo uh, a few years ago. Uh, two days ago, and we're taping this on uh, Friday, May 31, uh, two days ago, the Air Force Research Lab put out a request for information, uh, a little bit uh, part of the administration's drive to go from mines to magnets, uh, looking for sintered neodymium iron boride rare earth permanent magnets. I just wanted to say sintered neodymium uh, iron boride, uh, which I think is cool. Talk to us a little bit about um, that initiative and how it fits more broadly into, you think, the industrial base um, focus that this new administration has. And you guys put a report out uh, just a little while ago on that as well. We did. About a year ago, we put out a report that looked really at analyzing the administration's executive order 13806 on the national security industrial base. Looked at a number of things, everything from the state of budgets to the policies within DOD for procuring, for acquisition and procurement of, of uh, capabilities, and included some, some discussion of the concerns we have about specific capabilities and specific components that are part of our industrial base. And I think this example kind of plays right into that. Um, there are going to be more like this where we, as a nation, start to see where our vulnerabilities are and what we need to do to protect ourselves from them. Generally, the the, I think the expectation has been over the years that op open trade with China would prevent some of these problems from occurring. I think we're realizing now as the broader U.S.-China relationship changes that that may not be something we can count on. So as a national security uh, concern, we have to have a, a, a way to secure the availability of these kinds of capabilities. And I think that's, this is the first example, perhaps, of, of taking a, a specific look at, at a specific capability. But I, I do think it's typical of the kind of thing we're going to have to do going forward. Uh, and where do you think, or first, I mean, you spent a long time up on the Hill. Uh, you were part of the legislative office, I think, early in the Bush administration, if I That's recall right. correctly. Um, you know, and historically, we've had a very, or the government has had a pretty laissez-faire, particularly after the end of the Cold War, approach to, you know, industry does what it does. It provides our industry. The free market, uh, let's let the free markets work. And a little bit of a reluctance to put that kind of investment and specific strategy and policy. Do you see a changing appetite, uh, both on the part of the industrial base, but also of lawmakers to say, hey, look, to protect some of these capabilities, uh, there's a national investment that we'll have to make at the end of the day. Look, I think it's a matter of balance. Uh, we certainly think that the best way to get the best capability to our warfighters is to use the free market system. It's proven itself over the years. Uh, there are things where there's not a, uh, an economic case that where we don't naturally, through the course of the economy, and economic forces uh, arrive at the capability that we need or the, or the components or materials that we need. This is one of those cases. Uh, some of these rare earths are not going to be sustained by our economy more broadly. So we may need to look at, uh, from a defense standpoint, having stockpiles, having investment in domestic capabilities, things that you wouldn't ordinarily sustain in a, in a pure free market. If we have to do that to get the capability to the warfighter, we have to do it. Um, let me ask you a little bit about tariffs. Uh, uh, the president, um, you know, has been looking at tariffs in order to drive change, whether it's with uh, China, whether it's been with Canada or, or even other allies around the world. Uh, he looks at it as a means to get to a better end, uh, in his view, a fairer end. Uh, now we have over immigration some very, very strong tariffs that are being imposed uh, on, on Mexico. As we, uh, as we tape this, I don't think there's any determination, and I'm not even sure there's been a response on from full response from the Mexican side. But but Mexico, like Canada, are critical elements of the U.S. Uh, industrial base, whether for aerospace components as, as well for defense components. What are the potential implications here ultimately for uh, the industrial base and ultimately for the Pentagon, which is a consumer, right? I mean, we ultimately as taxpayers are the consumer of these products. Look, we believe in free and fair trade, and I think that needs to be the objective of, of anything that takes place right now. 
But, but as I said, as we move uh, and try to make sure we maintain the capabilities that we need, uh, we may have to have alternate policies that get us through a period where there's constraints on trade. And whether that's with Mexico and some production capability there, or China and raw materials, or Canada and raw materials, however that plays out, the most important thing from our perspective is to be able to produce what we need to have. And, and again, that may require more things like what the Air Force is doing in this case, um, securing access to the resources that we need to make what we need. Um, do, uh, let me ask you on the budget. Uh, budget process is moving its way forward. I know you've got your uh, eyes uh, focused on that. What are some of your concerns as this product uh, process unfolds? You know, every expert we talk to, uh, including members, uh, say, hey, look, this is going to be a messy process, but ultimately we're going to get it right. But now there's, there's a little bit of a concern we might be able, we might have to return to a CR. Their debt uh, ceiling increases. Their worries about whether impeachment talk is going to be able to derail, you know, derail the train uh, somehow as, as well. Ultimately, you know, what, how do you see this landscape forming up, and how soon do you think we're going to have a deal that lifts spending caps and gets us to at least some form of regular order in a, in a process that does seem, as you look at it now, somewhat disorderly? I can tell you what we'd like to see. We'd like to see another two-year deal that gets us to the remainder of the Budget Control Act. We saw that for the last two years that worked very, very well. It gave us a lot of stability, both for the DOD and their budget planning uh, and for our industry and planning around that to meet, meet the requirements that the Department of Defense puts on us. That's what we'd like to see. Uh, the backstop of the debt ceiling was was driving that, and that I, I believe was going to be sometime in the September time frame. It now appears that that backstop is moving out just by because of broader economic uh, factors. Uh, we want to see that two-year deal. We want to see some stability. We talked a minute ago about the industrial base assessment that was done and the, 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 that we looked at. The first and foremost concern for our industrial base is, is robust, balanced, sustained spending of predictable budgets. We can't run our industry properly when we get all kinds of mixed signals on, on what the, how programs are going are to unfold. So this is, this is an industrial base issue too, the budget issue. Uh, let me ask you one last question, and, and that's sort of the balance, uh, right? Um, well, as I said, during the Cold War, much more active industrial planning on the part of the of the government. Contractors sort of understood that and bared along with it. Then we went to, hey, budgets are dropping. Let's try to be efficient. Let's let free markets handle some of this stuff. I think there was an acknowledgment it went a little bit too far to vest even requirements and stuff into industry. Now some of that's been pulled back uh, under under the guise of, hey, you know, we are the guys who should be making some of these make buy decisions. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, as you talk to your membership. Uh, both, both very, very big companies and including smaller ones. Is there any consensus that's emerging about the kind of balance between how directive the system should be and how much free market? You know, if, if there was going to be an industrial strategy or policy, have you guys been talking about what the right touch and approach to that should be? In general, I think it should be minimal. We should have, as much as possible, clear requirements from DOD, a clear understanding of what the threats are that the department is trying to manage and what the services and warfighters are trying to, to, to build toward, uh, sustain funding. We do a very good job of reading our customer. We do an excellent job of, of matching our, our production, our capabilities to what our customer asks of us. If we can get clear signals on that, I think we can do very well. Now, we're talking today about something where there isn't necessarily that market case, where we're, we're almost on emer an emergency basis having to, having to have capabilities. That's a different matter. But by and large, I think if we can get to you know, steady and predictable funding at the right levels and a really good understanding between the warfighter on the one end and our industry on the other, uh, as to what DOD wants to produce and what problems DOD is trying to solve out in the world, I think we can manage that very well. We've shown ourselves as an industry over time to be very, very good at, at meeting requirements and, and adapting to different kinds of economic and geopolitical conditions. And are you satisfied with the dialogue between you uh, and the department, Ellen Lord, Al Schaefer, uh, Dr. Griffin? We are, very much. Uh, we, we've enjoyed, I think, in, in, in the last few years in particular, an excellent level of dialogue. We, we not only meet with our, at, from our CEO level to the, to the principals in the department, but all through the chain of command in, in, uh, in uh, OSD and in the services. We have a, a good ability to reach out. We get consulted and asked a lot about what we think and on various kinds of issues. We're deeply involved, for example, in the cybersecurity 
policy development in, in DOD. So I think, by and large, it's, it's very, very good. Not always. And there are, th there are times where DOD needs to do things, perhaps, that where they can't bring industry in on the front end. But we think that there's, there's less of that than there has been in the past. And generally speaking, we feel pretty good about our ability to communicate. With, with the leadership there. Uh, you mentioned uh, cyber, and I should say that the uh, the centered uh, neodymium iron boride issue is, is part of Title III, right? Uh, we should we should say that uh, as uh, from uh, uh, it's National Defense Supply, the National Defense Production Act, That's right? That's right, the Defense Production Act. Um, so let me ask you about cyber, one last question. Um, the Baltimore hack uh, is uh, obviously the latest in a long series of breaches, whether it was at OPM, but that's, you know, it has affected rather dramatically a major city not very far from Washington, and a major city that's decided it's not going to pay that $100,000 uh, Bitcoin ransom uh, that uh, th those who locked up the city's computers uh, uh, have demanded. Um, does this highlight for you, and, and does the nation need to have a better and more integrated view of cyber strategy and cybersecurity at the end of the day from an AIA and from an industry perspective? No, I don't think this changes anything because I believe for the last couple of years we've been really aggressively working with DOD to, to improve cybersecurity. Uh, we, it's something we have a shared interest in. Our companies have no, no advantage in being vulnerable from a cyber standpoint. We've worked really hard across the levels of our industry to have the prime contractors help the middle and lower tiers in their in their supply chains become more secure. We've tried to develop a system where uh, we have uh, uh, different ways of measuring that threat-based cybersecurity that that can really respond to the dynamic threat of cyber uh, the, the the dynamic cyber threats. So I don't think this is any any uh, adds any in it, extra energy to that. We've been working on it really hard, and I think. I'm pleased with the fact that our industry has come together around an, the National Airspace Standard 9933 that we put together. And uh, increasingly, the department is looking at that as a model for some of its approach to having an industry-wide and, and really DOD ecosystem-wide standard approach to cybersecurity. I think we're, we're all fully engaged in this. This is probably the issue we talk about most, frankly, with DOD. John Luddy, the Vice President for National Security Policy here at the Aerospace Industries Association. John, thanks very much. Really appreciate it. You bet. Glad to have you here. Thanks.